Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk about national musical instruments, even for those nations who don't think they have them. Now, you know, Europe, I was a European historian. That was sort of my training. I have two master's degrees in that subject. And my mother was a history teacher for most of her, her career. And we always had a good time talking about the foibles of various European nations as they pertained to European history. For example, my mother came up with the following absolutely foolproof way to understand European political history between 1600 and World War I. And it really works if you think about it. This is her formulation. If you want to figure out the source of every military conflict that happened between that period, between about 1600 and, and, and World War I, you have to keep in mind the following four principles. They are as follows. Russia wants a warm water port. In other words, they're always fighting in the south to get access to something that doesn't freeze. England patrols the seas. England protects its empire and dominates the ocean trading lanes. And so they fight to keep, to keep trade going in all of the colonies and other places. If it happens in Central Europe, which is where, of course, most conflicts did happen, then you solve it by partitioning Poland. It's very, very simple. You know, once, once everyone's exhausted, you just carve up Poland and you move on until the next one. And then finally, and last but not least, if it happens in Western Europe, then Alsace-Lorraine changes hands, depending on who had it last. If Germany had it last, France gets it. If France had it last, Germany gets it. And if you keep in mind those principles, you can really disentangle all of like European political history between 1600 and World War I. Thank you, Mom. Of course, after World War I, things became more complicated. You had like Lebensraum and all of those things. But, you know, but for a good few centuries, Mom is in very, very good shape with that, that formulation. The other thing about, you know, Russian history, uh, Russian history, European history, is that, you know, we, we in the European history biz used to talk about, you know, national foibles. And some of you may have heard this one, too. I don't know. But it was, it was quite popular a few decades ago in historical circles. And uh, the major power national characteristics could be summarized as follows. In Italy, nothing works and nobody cares. In France, nothing works, but they refuse to admit it. In Germany, everything works, but they think nothing works. And in England, nothing works, but they're terribly sorry about it, and they have no idea how to fix it or when it's going to work. There you go. How to summarize your European national character in a nutshell. That was really pretty, pretty handy, actually. So I propose in this little chat to do the same with musical instruments. Now, there are some small countries, particularly, that have strong folk traditions that have national instruments. You know, you've got bagpipes in Scotland, and you've got, you've got a cymbalum, for example, in Hungary. And, you know, they're, they're peasant things, but we're talking about the major European powers and well-known instruments. And I've been thinking about what instruments best typify those particular countries. And so this is my proposal. And if you have one, of course, I'd be delighted, delighted to hear what you have to say about this too. So let's begin with Italy, the birthplace of music, and of course, the birthplace of that most musical of all instruments, the violin. The violin has to be the national symbol of Italy because you had Guarneri and Stradivarius and all those guys, Stradivari, whatever his name was. You know, they were all in Cremona running around building violins and things. And if it weren't for Italy and if it weren't for the violin, we would not have music as we know it at all. So, I mean, Italy was just a really, really easy call. But after that, things get a little bit more complicated. They really do. So let's, let's move slightly north. Let's do, let's do France. France, I thought about long and hard, and I have come to the conclusion that France is, for the most part, at least, the flute. 
it has to be the flute because all of the great composers of flute music, or most of them, were, were French. I mean, especially continuing past the Baroque. Remember, in the Baroque period, everybody played the flute. And there were like other composers who wrote lots of flute music, like Quants and people like that. They did flute everything. But, but the, the language of that kind of music, the style of that music, was largely French anyway. So even if they were German, they were really French. I mean, who are they kidding, right? So, so the flute survived the Baroque period into the classical period and the Romantic period. And most of the flute music that you hear these days, modern flute music, is French. It's Iber flute concerto. And, you know, it's French. Let's face it, it's French. I could have chosen also the harp, but there just isn't enough repertoire for it, contemporary repertoire. There's tons of Romantic repertoire for the harp, and a lot of it is French. And the, most of the major developments of the instrument, for example, the harp and the flute were, you know, they happened in France. So French is without a doubt the flute, but also the timbre of the flute, its agility, its nimbleness, its lightness, its fluffiness, its tendency toward frivolity, its, its sexiness, all of those things really do fit the French temperament, I think. And, and so the flute is without a doubt the symbol of France. Some, some French people might want something a little bit more weighty, so they can have the alto flute. I mean, there are many members of the flute family, after all, and French composers were among the first to use them extensively. So, you know, they use alto flutes. There's a bass flute. Who knew? So there you go. It's the flute. It could also be a saxophone. I don't know. France is just full of possibilities. But I'm sticking by the flute. So after France, let's go over to Russia. Well, Russia is a little interesting because Russia, Russian music is essentially French also. I mean, Russian musical culture was, was very closely tied to France. So you might think it would be the flute too, but it's not because, of course, the flute is entirely too light and shiny and, and, and lively for the Russian character, which has to be somewhat dour and darker and more suited to long winters. And for, but it has to be a woodwind instrument because the culture is basically French right? So I chose the bassoon. The bassoon is the quintessential Russian instrument. And the reason is because Russian music is full of fabulous bassoon solos. Think of that wonderful solo in, in the third movement of Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony, you know, which is very, very difficult. Or the very opening of Tchaikovsky's Patatique. <laughs> bassoon or or grandpa in peter and the wolf right and then there was that amazing exploitation of the bassoon by stravinsky the crazy opening of the rite of spring or that horrifying introduction for a couple of bassoons in the symphony in c or god knows thrainy which is full of all this prowly, gnarly bassoon writing. I mean, Russians really knew their bassoons, and they wrote for them with incredible love and affection. And I mean, Shostakovich had great bassoon solos. All these Russian composers. I mean, Russian music is symbolized by the bassoon. I am absolutely convinced of it. Then, well, let's see what else have we got. England, of course, England. England is easy because there was no English music, of course, until the 20th century, basically. And once we got there, it was overwhelmingly the viola. And I, I, I'm not surprised because, you know, as I've said before, the viola is kind of a, a special needs violin. And, and, you know, the English have always rooted for the underdog. They really have. And so they picked the viola. They picked the viola because it wasn't getting any love from anybody else. Now, this does not mean that they particularly like the viola. It just means that they felt obliged out of fairness and, and equanimity to support the viola. As a result, there is tons of English music 20th century English music for the viola. There are concerti, there are sonatas, there are all kinds of, even Britain wrote like lacrime for viola and orchestra. It's viola stuff. So Britain is without it, Britain, Britain the composer and Britain the country, let's put it that way, they are without a doubt the land of the viola. And it's somewhat dusky timbre, sort of fits the, you know, kind of November grayish rainy climate and the, and that 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 
particular, you know, a chaste lack of sex appeal that's so so typical of so much English music. I really think that that the viola is is the instrument of the English, unquestionably, no doubt about it. And last but not least, you know, I, I thought long and hard about this. We have to do Germany, but what on earth could it could it be? I mean, I agonized. I went through the entire list of orchestral instruments. I mean. You know, I mean, everything from tubas and contrabassoons to, you know, other things, oboes and, 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 and theremins and, you know, whatever I could come up with to really encapsulate the German character. And I think at the end of the day, I had to pick the organ. Really, it's the organ, not just because Bach was the greatest composer for the organ and he was German, but because, you know, sort of that creaky gothic horror sound associated with the organ really does sort of say, you know, Deutschland über alles, doesn't it? I mean, don't you think? I mean, it's, it's an instrument that has at once a certain, you know, Prussian coldness and aloofness, and at the same time, this sort of all-encompassing tambral megalomania and desire for conquest. Somehow, somehow there isn't any other instruments, the instrument that I think slots into the German character in the same way that the organ does. And so that essentially is my, is my, how many did we do? We did Italy, we did France, we did Russia, we did, we did England, we did Germany, five. My top five. The violin for Italy, the flute for France, the viola for England, the bassoon for Russia, and the organ for Germany. Those are the great national instruments. And I would be more than delighted to see what you could come up with. I have no idea what the United States would be, frankly, and I did think about that. I was really trying to come up with something that would work for the United States, but I couldn't because the United States is... Uh, in my view, anyway, is a mishmash. It's just a, a giant concatenation of little bits of everything else. So maybe, maybe the panharmonicon or whatever that thing was that Beethoven originally wrote you know, Wellington's Victory for, you know, that contraption that played little bits of every possible instrument all, all compressed into one or something like that. I mean, that's a possibility. Or maybe the Moog synthesizer. I don't know. I, I really don't know. I don't know. But for those European countries, in keeping with my own background in European history and my intense study of the European national character, those are what I've come up with. And I'm more than curious to hear your own take on it. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.